Hello, my friends. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes, and uh, I am just excited about being with you in the third episode in our series on uh, Trinitarian theologians and their modalistic trinity. The purpose of these uh, of this series is to demonstrate to our Trinitarian friends that you don't have to be a societal Trinitarian that teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have separate centers of consciousness and are uh, three eyes, three egos, if you would. Uh, that's tritheism. That's heresy. And those of you that believe that are heretics. Uh, but you don't have to believe that to still embrace the Trinity. And uh, embracing the Trinity seems to be important to you because so many people have been uh, horrified and terrified with the statement of the Athanasian Creed, before all things to be saved, you must believe the Trinity. Well, you can believe the Trinity uh, without being caught into the vortex of tritheism. So that's one purpose of this series. Another purpose of this series is to demonstrate to my modalistic brethren that we could, if the need arose, embrace the term Trinity, embrace even the term God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost. We could conceivably even embrace the existence of an eternal Son if we held to the concept of uh, of some of the ancient church fathers, such as Athenagoras and Tertullian, that the Son is simply the word of God from his thought, that when God uh, spoke a word, that that was the Son because it was begotten from his nos, from his thought. Even some go so far as to say when God had a thought, that was the Lagos. So then, we cannot conceive of a sentient God without thought ever. So we could conceive then of that thought of God being eternal. And then when that thought was birthed at the creation, when he said, let there be, if we, we could agree with Tertullian that that could be the nativity of the Son or the Word of God. Uh, you see, for a hundred years, Trinitarians and, and, and oneness have been talking past one another. Uh, perhaps these videos will help us talk to one another. Amen. It is true that if you teach and worship a societal trinity, you're not a Christian. You are a heretic and you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. But it is possible to worship the God of the Bible and, and call yourself Trinitarian, even embrace the terminology as long as your mental concept of the Trinity is, is orthodox, is biblical. And so we're sharing these theologians. In our first video, it was Tertullian. In our second video, it was Karl Barth. I invite you to go back and, and view these. And here, we're going to be talking about Alistair McGrath, right after we pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness. We ask, dear God, that you would anoint our minds and our hearts and our lips, that we might perceive, believe, and speak your truth. We ask these things in the name of Jesus in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. One God, world without end. Amen. So here we're going to go right to this theologian. I like Alistair McGrath. I like him a lot. Uh, because, uh, well, because he speaks a language I can understand. And hopefully, he'll speak a language that you can understand as well. McGrath is a modern-day Trinitarian theologian that is uh, lauded throughout the world 
as the top uh, in intellectual, one of the top intellectuals of the day. So let me explain to you a little bit who McGrath is. McGrath was born in 1953. Now that makes him three years my junior. Uh, but oh, so far ahead of me in academic achievement. He was born uh, in Northern Ireland. He's a Northern Irish theologian. He's a priest in the Anglican Church. Uh, intellectual historian, scientist, Christian apologist. He's a public intellectual. Now, he currently holds the Andreas Iteris Professorship in Science and Religion in the Faculty of Theology and Religion and is a fellow of Harris Manchester College at the University of Oxford. He is Professor of Divinity at Grisham College. He was previously professor of theology, ministry, and education at King's College London and head of the Center for Theology, Religion, and Culture, professor of historic theology at the University of Oxford and was a principal of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford until 2005. And as, as I've said, he's an Anglican priest. Now, aside from being a faculty member at Oxford, McGrath has also taught at Cambridge University and is a teaching fellow at Regent College. McGrath holds three doctorates from the University of Oxford, a doctoral degree, degree in molecular biophysics, a doctor in divinity, degree in theology, and a doctor of letters degree in intellectual history. McGrath is noted for his work in historical theology, systematic theology, and the relationship between science and religion, as well as his writings on apologetics. He is also known for his opposition to the new atheism and uh, his advocacy for theological critical realism. Among his best known books are The Twilight of Atheism, the Dawkins Delusion, Dawkins is God, and The Meaning of Life and a Scientific Theology. He is also the author of a number of popular textbooks that are currently being used in universities uh, and seminaries throughout the world. So this is Alistair McGrath, not one of small significance, but a giant in our world of intellectualism and theology today. So we're going to go right into his book entitled Understanding the Trinity. And I'll be giving you the page numbers <clears throat> from which these quotations are pulled. I am quoting now Alistair McGrath, quote, if you look at the doctrine of the early church during the first two and a half centuries or so, you will think that the doctrine of the Trinity has yet to be developed. The development took place in the third and the fourth centuries. I want to go back and read that again because I read a wrong word. Quote, if you look at the doctrine of the early church during the first two and a half centuries or so, you will find, I read think a while ago, you will find that the doctrine of the Trinity has yet to be developed. That development took place in the third or fourth centuries. End quote. Alistair McGrath, Understanding the Trinity, page 116. Again, quote, once upon a time, there was a committee. It had three members. Now, committees are things which exist to find something to do. And so they set up a project. It was a complicated and long-term development project, which took a long time to get off the ground. But it eventually got going, and the committee was pleased with the way it seemed to be working. The project was a long way from the committee's offices, however, so communication was something of a problem. 
Soon the project developed some teething problems, so the chairman paid occasional visits to the project, firing some of its directors and hiring new ones. But things got worse, and the committee realized that it would have to monitor the project on a more long-term basis. So the three of them decided that one of them would have to uh, spend some time living and working on the project and put things right. So which one would do it? Not me, said the chairman. Someone has to stay back at the office and keep an eye on things. And so the other two committee members drew straws, and the short straw was drawn by Mr. Davidson. So Mr. Davidson was sent off to the project. Don't forget to keep in touch, and we will expect a full report from you on your return were the parting words of the chairman. <laughs> now, this is really a rather pointless story, except that it illustrates all too well the way in which a lot of Christians think about the Trinity. In their thinking, Jesus is basically one member of the divine committee, the one who is sent down to earth to report on things and put things right with the creation. Now, earlier we looked at biblical models of God, but nowhere in Scripture is God modeled on a committee. The idea of an old man in the sky is bad enough, but the idea of a committee somewhere in the sky is even worse. What we wonder might be on their agenda. What we wonder might be on their agenda. How often would the chairman have to cast his vote to break a tie between the other two? No, the whole idea is ludicrous. End quote. Alistair McGrath, page 119 and 120. In his book entitled, Understanding the Trinity. And then again, quote, The word person... Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here we go again. Is McGrath going to disagree with the word person too? Well, let's see. Quote, the word person has changed its meaning. Oh, wait, wait. That's what Bart said. Okay, let's start again. Quote, the word person has changed its meaning since the third century when it began to be used in connection with the Threefoldness of God. When we talk about God as a person, we naturally think of God as being one person. But theologians such as Tertullian, writing in the third century, use the word person with a different meaning. The word person originally derives from the Latin word persona, meaning an actor's mask, and by extension, the role which he takes in a play. By stating that there were three persons, but only one God, Tertullian was asserting that all three major roles in the great drama of human redemption are played by the one and the same God. The three great roles in this drama are all played by the same actor, God. Each of these roles may reveal God in a somewhat different way, but it is the same God in every case. So when we talk about God as one person, we mean one person in the modern sense of the word. And when we talk about God as three persons, we mean three persons in the ancient sense of the word. God is God and God alone who masterminded and executes the great plan of salvation, culminating in Jesus Christ. Confusing these two senses of the word person inevitably leads to the idea that God is actually a committee, which, as we saw earlier, is a thorough, thoroughly 
unhelpful and confusing way of thinking about God, end quote. Alistair McGrath, page 130 and 131. And then again, for a quote, for example, if Jesus is thought of as being a prophet, but not a priest or king, we find his identity and significance reduced to that of a religious teacher. If we think of him as both prophet and king, but not as priest, we find him being portrayed as an authoritative religious teacher who rules over those whom he teaches, but whom he doesn't redeem. Only by bringing all three models together do we build up the authentic Christian understanding of the identity of Jesus, the one who redeems his people, who instructs them, and who rules over them with authority. With this illustration in mind, let's return to talking about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A helpful way of looking at this is to say that three essential models must be used if the full depth of the Christian experience and understanding of God is to be expressed adequately. No one picture, image, or model of God is good enough. And these three models are essential if the basic outlines of the Christian understanding of God is to be preserved. The first model is that of the transcendent God who lies beyond the world and as its source and as its creator. The second is the human face of God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The third is that of the imminent God who is present and active throughout his creation. The doctrine of the Trinity affirms that these three models combine to define the essential Christian insight into the God who raised Jesus from the dead. None of them taken on its own is adequate to capture the richness of of the Christian experience of God, end quote. Alistair McGrath, page 136 and 137. And then again, quote, it may be that certain actions emphasize that God is Father, just as others may emphasize that he is Son, but God acts as a trinity throughout all his works. Thus, even in creation itself, we find reference to the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. End quote. Alistair McGrath, Understanding the Trinity, page 137. And then again, quote, The following analogy may help bring out the distinctive roles of the doctrine of the Trinity. Imagine a river, perhaps a great river like the Nile or the Mississippi. As it enters the sea, maybe through a great estuary, you wonder what the source of the river is like and where it might be. Let us suppose that you own a small boat which you launch into the estuary and begin the journey upstream to trace the river to its source. Perhaps like the great expeditions of the last century which set out to search the source of the Nile. You begin from where the river rushes in to embrace the sea, and then you follow the course of its stream until finally, maybe a very long time later, you realize that the great lake which you have just entered has no other streams entering or leaving it you have traced the river to its source. The first point to make is the following. The estuary, the stream, and the course are all part of the same thing, the river. All three collectively make up the totality of that river. 
and the absence of any of them is unthinkable. A river must have a source, the flux or strain, stream, and a place at which it enters the sea or another lake. The 11th century theologian Anselm of Canterbury used the analogy of the River Nile to make a very similar point. It is, however, the second point which is more important. We begin the search for the source of the river at the point at which it met the sea. The point at which its flux, its stream or flow entered the sea. It was this point which allowed us to gain entry to the flux of the stream itself. And it was the stream itself which both guided us to its source and provided the means by which we might get there. It pointed the way and gave us the medium on which the boat would travel safely. And finally, its source was reached. Now it's here that we found our journeys in. Can you see that it was the river itself, from the estuary to the stream to the source, which both pointed the way to and provided the means of reaching our objective? <laughs> At every point in the river, the river itself helped us in our search, providing both directions and the medium of transportation. Although our interest was really in the source of the river, every point on that river, whether the estuary or stream, derived from that source. We are already encountering the water from that source as we entered the river estuary. Perhaps it was not immediately recognizable as the water from the source, but the fact remains that it was the self-same water. My. McGrath continues. Let us use this illustration to help us understand the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity affirms that even as we begin our search for God, it is God who helps us to find him. It is God who sets us on the right path, directs us and provides us with the means we need to find him. God is involved from the beginning to the end of our search for him, of our encounter with him. It may be that we do not recognize God fully for what he is and what he's doing, but the fact remains that he is involved. God is both the goal of our journey and the means by which we find him. We come to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. At every stage, God is already there, and it is insights such as these that the doctrine of the Trinity is meant to safeguard by preventing us from adopting inadequate views of God. End quote. Alistair McGrath, page 140, 141, and 142 of Understanding the Trinity. So there, beloved, we have some quotes from this great theologian, scientist, secular intellectual, Anglican priest, amen. His trinity is not a trinity of societal, uh, self-conscious, rational, individual, sentient being. He used the illustration of Ansem and also of Tertullian. Tertullian said you have the fountain who is the father, the source. You have the stream who is the Holy Spirit. And then you have the channels which uh, is likened to the Holy Ghost or, 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 or the Son. Amen.
Alistair McGrath makes the same illustration of the estuary and then wanting to find the, the source of the sun. Well, you found the source already when you find the sun, he says. That God, the Father, the source, is the stream, the flux, and is the estuary emptying out into the ocean of humanity. So here, beloved, you have a modalistic trinity. Different modes, the estuary, the stream, the fountain. But it's all the Father. It's all the source. It's all the autotheos. Amen. Tertullian recognized the autotheos as the Father. Bart recognized the autotheos as the Father. And McGrath recognizes the autotheos as the Father. And the stream and the estuary, the Son and the Holy Ghost are only self revelations and functions administrations of the Father. This, beloved, is modalism 101. Those of you that are societal Trinitarians that insist that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are, are, are you don't like the word separate, but that's a, that's a coward's way out. You teach they're separate you will embrace the, that they are distinct, and so does modalism. They are distinct. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are distinct from one another. They are not each other, but they are the same autotheos. That's oneness. That is modalism, beloved. Embrace that. Continue to use the word Trinity. Continue to use the word God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost. All like that but worship only one autotheos. Amen. When time permits, we will be back with uh, the quotes from uh, Carl Rayner and also from Moses Stewart. I haven't got them together yet, so I can make a video from them, but we have given you three, three in this series, Tertullian, Carl Barth, and Alistair McGrath. So you Trinitarians, consider the words of these great theologians and you oneness, you modalists, consider that when you are witnessing to the Trinitarians that uh, you don't have to attack his terms because you can accept his terms the way that these theologians have used the terms and explained them. God is one who has manifested himself in the uh, personas, in the roles, in the modes, and even person, if we define person the way that Tertullian and the early church fathers understood it, and not in the medieval and modern term of understanding person as involving a self-consciousness. Amen. So I hope that uh, these, this has blessed you and I hope that you can use them. And if you can, pass them on, share them with others. Uh, the Lord bless you. I am Jerry Hayes and we'll, until, we'll talk, until we are together again, I pray that you go with God and that God goes with you and that the Lord sanctify you wholly in your mind and in your body and in your spirit. Amen and amen.